Thank you, Arthur, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Jean, for the invitation. Although this is my first time visiting University of Michigan campus, I do frequently visit Michigan every year, just because I think um, Lake Michigan is better on the Michigan side than the Illinois side. So, um, let me turn on, the, okay. So, uh, my lab focused on structural variations, which is equivalent to genomic rearrangements. That include deletions, insertions, duplications, inversions, uh, translocations, and some of them can be fairly complex. And these are some examples of deletion, inversion. I think those are pretty simple. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the two main directions of the lab. One is uh, how they form in cancer. And the other is once they form, how do they drive the disease? Before talking about what we actually did, I want to give you an overview of um, the 1,000 mile high landscape of the somatic SDs in cancer, what you would expect if you sequence a lot of cancer genomes. So here in this plot, in this plot, each dot, although it's very small, but every dot is a tumor and it's grouped based on tumor types. Uh, on, so on the left side, you see the tumor types of sarcoma, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. They tend to have very unstable genome, lots of uh, SVs. And on the other side, you have those uh, blood cancer, pediatric cancer. They tend to have quieter genomes. But every tumor type you look, there's a three order of magnitude difference. Some tumors have less than 10. SVs and some tumors have up to a thousand SVs and that's pretty much universal in every tumor type you look at. And then down there you have a breaking down of the contribution of complex SVs versus simple SVs. I'll tell you more about the complex SVs in just a second. So in each block you would notice that on the left side you have enriched of this complex SVs. That means if you have a tumor with lots of SVs, they tend to be contributed because of this uh, abundant complex SVs. So speaking of complex SVs, chromothripsis is uh, the extreme example of something could be that complex. So here I'm showing you uh, one kidney cancer genome. That's one tumor genome. And uh, the, all the chromosomes are listed in a circle and these uh, blue, red, curves in this circle represent interchromosomal, intrachromosomal SVs. So I'm sure you can tell that chromosome five and 13 have a lot going on while other chromosomes are fairly quiet. So this phenomenon is called chromothripsis. And this term was invented in 2011. And it, it was very bizarre because it argues against our current understanding of how uh, cancer would arise from normal cells. Uh, our old understanding was uh, we have a trillion cells in our body and uh, each individual cell slowly acquires somatic mutations. And at some point, one cell acquired a specific combination of mutations disrupt several key genes. Then that cell becomes the ancestor of cancer cells. And this chromothripsis is bizarre because there's no such mechanism known to produce a rearrangement just targeting one or two chromosomes. So this thing has to occur as a one-time event. That concept itself is also bizarre because there's no such mechanism known to produce something like this as a one-time event either. So the field has been puzzled for years and now we know that this is true. There are actually ma multiple mechanisms can produce chromothripsis as a one-time event. So in case you have not heard of chromothripsis uh, before, one day I was watching a movie with my kids, spies in disguise. So this guy was a spy and then this kid was a scientist who made a potion supposed to turn human invisible. So after this person drink that potion, his genome underwent chromothripsis. I was like, wow, these Hollywood screenwriters, they are really up to date in science. 
So back to how this could possibly happen, there are, again, as I mentioned, there are multiple mechanisms. One of them is the micronuclei. So during cell division, the two uh, daughter cells, they should have one set of chromosomes inherited from the mother cells. And during this chromosome segregation process, sometimes one of the chromosomes does not move as fast as the rest, so it's lagging behind. Then once the cell division complete, the main nuclei form and the, most of the chromosomes are in the, in, in, in the nucleus. And this lagging chromosome will be trapped into a structure called a micronuclei. It also has a, has a nuclear uh, membrane. But the DNA replication, DNA uh, damage repair are both deficient in micronuclei. And then you could even see under the microscope that the chromosome trapped in micronuclei can indeed break down into hundreds of pieces. And these pieces somehow will randomly stitch together into a new bizarre chromosome. And somehow some of these chromosomes can move back to the main nuclear and join the majority of the chromosome and stay there. So another process is called the chromatin bridge. This process starts with a dicentric chromosome, which is pretty common in cancer because in a cancer, the cell division is uh, continuous. So the telomere will get shortened and shortened. Uh, at some point, uh, there, will, there will be no more protein to, to bind the telomere to protect uh, the, the naked DNA ends. And then the free DNA ends, the cell won't, won't like that. So they will fuse to another free DNA end. So that can, that's one uh, possibility to create a dicentric chromosome. And then you have translocations. If it's unbalanced, and then you can also produce a dicentric chromosome. So then this dicentric chromosome during cell division, they get the two centromeres get pulled towards two different daughter cells. And even hours after the cell division being complete, you can still see under the microscope that the two daughter cells are connected by a thin DNA fiber. That's called the chromatin bridge. And this bridge can break down into many pieces and the pieces can join together into a new bizarre chromosome and become uh, stable in, in, in a cell. And then once you have this uh, dicentral chromosome, you break it in the middle, that will create another free DNA end. So that free DNA end can go through this cycle that ligate to another chromosome form another dicentric chromosome and go on, go on. So you, the, the end product is uh, you might have loss and then gain of DNA fragments go, going through this uh, called a breakage fusion bridge cycles. So all of these are, are uh, experimentally proven that this would indeed happen, but they produce complex rearrangement of so-called chromophrypsis with different patterns. For example, in micronuclei, the breakpoints are usually randomly distributed across the chromosome. But in chromatin bridge, the, the DNA fragments are broken because of mechanical forces. So there are hotspots of these uh, broken uh, uh, fragments. And then in these two cases, depending on how many copies of the chromosomes are involved, you get either two or three copy state if you look at the copy number. And then if the chromosome has undergone a multiple cycles of BFB, then you may have more than two or three copies. Then another phenomenon, and this is really um, a phenotype rather than a mechanism, is called the circular extra chromosomal DNA. So these are a uh, small circular DNA that really looks like a plasmid in bacteria that we do have frequently have in tumor cells. About half of the tumor cells have ECDNA, they are small circular and they don't follow Mendelian segregation. So they can have dozens or hundreds of copies. So what you would see as a pattern is uh, you have a lot of small fragments coming from different places of the genome and they are highly amplified. One way to generate the ECDNA is those broken DNA from micronuclei or chromatin bridge, some of the fragments somehow stitched together into a circle. So that's the one source of ECDNA. So now we know that there are multiple mechanisms and there are different patterns. Uh, we want to study the mechanism um, or signature that uh, what, what mechanism actually contributes more to, to the complex rearrangement that you see in cancer. So before doing that, we have to detect 
the complex rearrangement from all those cumulative whole genome sequence of data. So we use this algorithm called the ShatterSeq developed by our colleague, uh, Isidro Cortez Siriano. So the basic concept is we're looking for a pattern like this. A lot of rearrangement, um, they cross each other. They concentrated on a small set of chromosomes and uh, there's an equal contribution of different types of rearrangement. Because if you think this is a random broken uh, chromosome and randomly stitched together, so the, these uh, connections should be crossing each other. Unlike in this case, even though you have quite a big number of SVs, but they are kind of isolated. So this pattern can be generated by individual SVs accumulating over time. And in, in this case, even though you have a pretty good number and they cross each other, but this can, everything is a duplication. So this can still be generated by repeated duplication. So we are looking for a pattern like this that it cannot be explained by a slow accumulation of individual SVs. So if you see a pattern like this, most likely is caused by a one-time event. So after running this on a, this PCOR consortium is really a TCGA plus ICGC to put all the whole genome sequence uh, tumors together. We have over 2000 whole genome sequence tumors across many different tumor types. So roughly half of the tumors have some kind of complex event in, in the genomes. So then we want to study which mechanism actually contribute more because the ones known are all produced in the lab that we don't know in the physiological condition which one is more prevalent in, in cancer. So many of you are probably familiar that you can use non-negative matrix, matrix factorization approach to decompose mutation signatures because if you have a multiple mutation mechanism going on and each tumor have a specific set of uh, contribution from a subset of the mechanisms, then you could use mathematical approach to elegantly extract the mutation signatures. And each signature supposedly can represent a molecular mechanism underlying those signatures. So for point mutation, this works very well. And those mutation patterns of uh, cytosine deamination, tobacco smoking, UV light, and Apoback and many others, you could very well extract the signature and they match the biochemistry experiment very well. So we tried this approach for two years, trying to come up with a way to construct an input matrix and somehow extract the signature and link the signature to what we know. But in the end, I realized this won't work because for something like this to work, you need to have tumors repeatedly accumulating the mutations from one of these mechanisms or a, a combination of these mechanisms. But for chrome thrombosis, each tumor, although you have lots of breakpoints, but they are all coming from one-time event. Each tumor only carry one or two chrome thrombosis. So, so the non-negative matrix factorization is really not suitable for, for this uh, context. Then a uh, postdoc in my lab, Lisa Bao, developed an algorithm called the starfish. So we have noticed the pattern of chrome thrombosis generated by different mechanisms are pretty unique. So we want to use these five features to describe the overall pattern of every single chrome thrombosis event from breakpoint dispersion score to measure the distribution across of breakpoints across the chromosome and the amount of copy loss, amount of copy gain, and the, and the, the copy, uh, maximum copy number and amount of telomere loss. The last one, telomere loss, is particularly useful because the chromatin bridge is associated with the loss of telomere because that's how the dissension could, uh, chromosome to start with. So then we did another simple thing is uh, if we put the chromothrapsis events look similar to each other together, what we see. So we did an unsupervised clustering. Um, so we end up with six clusters that's pretty robust. You, you can do all kinds of uh, ways of clustering. You always get six clusters, the very stable. So now the question is, which cluster belongs to what? So we took advantage of 
five of published studies, they either induce chrome fragments by inducing micronuclei or inducing chromatin bridge in the lab. So these are all experimentally induced. We know these as a ground truth. So we just ask if we run the same thing on these events, uh, can we can we see patterns? So now the most of the micronuclei induced chrome fragments have this green color. And most of the chromatin bridge induced chrome fragments have this orange color. So if you we go back to this pattern that green color is the signature four that we called. Um, the pattern is it has the lowest breakpoint dispersion score, meaning the breakpoints are evenly distributed on the chromosome, which is consistent to, with what we know about the mechanism. And then if you look at the orange color signature two here, it's, it has the highest score for telomere loss. As I mentioned earlier, telomere loss is how you generate a dicentric chromosome in the first place, then that will go through chromatin bridge. So that's also consistent with what we know about the mechanism. So here are the, some examples that this is the, the initial uh, kidney cancer genome I showed you earlier, the chromosome five, chromosome 13, you have a lot of rearrangements and the, the, the breakpoints are roughly evenly distributed across the chromosome. And this part is the copy number that you see on both chromosomes, you have about three state of uh, copy number. And this is an example of chromatin bridge that you can see that the, the breakpoints are highly concentrated and you have more than three copy state. Um, then you also have a pretty large amount of telomere loss. So then we have another signature, uh, which is related to small fragment being highly amplified. So the scale is like some fragments can be amplified above 60 copies. So these are uh, matching the signature of ECDNA and it's also called the double minute in the early state in the early years. Any questions? Yeah, feel free to stop me if you have questions. So now, out of these six signatures, we have already connected three of them with the known biological mechanisms or uh, processes. Then we have three other new signatures. We name them large loss, large gain, and hourglass. Hourglass is particularly interesting. I want to uh, show you more of that. So the signature here has multiple features. For example, it has the highest breakpoint dispersion score, meaning they, they are, the breakpoints are highly localized. And they have a, a little bit of copy loss, but pretty much no copy gain. So I show you one example that this is the one chromosome from prostate cancer. So the, the, the SV breakpoint, you could see that they are highly concentrated in very uh, specific locations of the chromosome. And every time you have this breakpoint, you have a very small amount of copy loss at the breakpoint. So why this is interesting, again, I want to show you an overview that this is what you would see if I break down all the tumor types and show you how much different things contribute in, in different tumor types. So um, on the left side, you have uh, glioblastoma, which is the brain cancer and the sarcoma and esophageal cancer and et cetera. So these tumor types, about 80% of them have complex rearrangement. And on this side, it's a pediatric brain cancer. This one is a, a leukemia. They tend to have very, again, very quiet genomes. And then if you look at these colors, they represent different signatures. And sometimes you see that, um, so each horizontal line represents one tumor. If you see something like this, that means one tumor have multiple uh, complex event and uh, one is one signature, the other is a different signature. So that's why we, you have this kind of uh, weird pattern. So overall, you see that most of the color is the pink, it's ECDNA. That's also consistent with what we know that ECDNA is very common in tumor. And then you also have other patterns. For example, you, in kidney cancer, you have a lot of orange, which is the chromatin bridge. And it's also known that kidney cancer has a very recurrent chromosome three, chromosome five translocations um, that's, that's known to be produced by this kind of um, mechanism. So it's also consistent with our current knowledge. And what's unique is here, this is prostate cancer. 
you see this such a unique enrichment of this signature six we call our glass complexes and you you see this um, signature that's spread in all over the tumor types but in in prostate cancer it's just uh, so enriched that half of the prostate cancer genomes carry this event so then we looked at uh multiple like we use the four different prostate cancer cohorts together we found that this gene as pop mutation of this gene is significantly correlated with actually three different signatures our glass micronuclei and uh, and another um signature that we don't really know the cause so s pop is the e3 ubiquitin ligase the function is to bind to the target protein and degrade them so the mutations are all point mutations in the DNA, uh, in the target binding domain so i think the uh, this this suggests that it's very likely the s pop has switched the target and that target switching may play important roles in controlling genome instability so then we shifted to study um, what about it, the rest of the simple SVs. Our motivation was um, the BRCA1, BRCA2. They are well-known well cases for breast cancer, ovarian cancer susceptibility. And you have your somatic mutation or germline mutation. You, uh, they, they, they will increase the, the, the cancer risk by 10 or 15 fold. And uh, it's known that BRCA1, BRCA2, they are in the homologous recombination pathway. So if you have a mutation, the homologous recombination, which is responsible for repair a lot of the DNA damage, will become deficient. And uh, in the SV part, it's very unique that the BRCA1 mutation always lead to small tandem duplications in the tumor, and the BRCA2 mutation always lead to small deletions, even though they work in the same pathway, but uh, the consequences are very different. And you're probably aware that uh, people like Angelina Julie carried a germline deleterious allele of BRCA who has a higher risk of getting breast cancer. So some people would, would choose to surgically remove their breast uh, to reduce their, their cancer risk. So this kind of uh, gene pathway deficiency is very useful in clinic in terms of patient monitoring and disease, disease uh, prognosis. And what's even more is uh, you could actually target this kind of uh, pathway deficiency with the PARP inhibitors as a synthetic lethal target. So we want to study a particular uh, interesting process, which is called the transcription and the replication collision. So this is a collision between DNA polymerase complex and the RNA polymerase complex. In normal cells, this is unavoidable because they use the same DNA template. So when they will compete with each other and they run into each other and they do crash all the time. But in normal cells, once this happens, they have the, there are um, repair mechanisms in place to properly repair the collision. For transcription, it's not too much of a problem. You can degrade the RNA and you can restart the transcription. But for DNA replication, if it crashed, it's a problem. It's a potential um, DNA damage and then the cell really have to properly repair that. So we think maybe a subset of the somatic SVs are driven by this process. So to do that, we first we use the non-negative matrix factorization to decompose the signatures of simple SVs. So now this time the simple SV really behave similar to point mutations. They accumulate independently uh, in the tumors, so we could really use the NMF method. So here we first divide the SVs into deletion, uh, tandem duplication, inversion, translocation. Then we further broke it down with the, the size. So the top one are, are small in size, the bottom ones are large in size, then you have all these gradient. So in total, we break down the SVs into four, 49 categories. Then we apply this uh, matrix factorization. We come up in this peacock cohort with over 2,000 primary whole genome sequence of tumors. We come up with about uh, either 12 or 13 uh, signatures. So you have four deletion signatures here and four tandem duplication signatures here, and then you have other 
uh, inversion translocation related signatures. Then we, so this was done by Yang Yang, another postdoc in the lab. This is currently unpublished. Then we can reproduce this in a, the independent cohort, which is a Hartwig cohort of over 2000 metastasis tumors. The previous cohort PCOG was all primary tumor. So in metastasis, we can pretty much get a very similar uh, robust signatures. We have uh, multiple deletion signatures, although we have a very small deletion signature here and the multiple tandem duplication signatures and the more of the, the inversion uh, translocation related signatures. So the signatures are pretty robust. And then how do we know which signature might be the result of this transcription replication collision? So if you look, look back at this figure, there are, there are patterns you could use. For example, um, if a NASV is truly the result of this collision, what you would expect? Because you, you have this uh, crash, the DNA replication. That means you have a dosage imbalance. So on this side, you have two copies because this part already been replicated. And on that side, it has not been replicated. So there's only one copy. So if you are forming, if this is properly repaired, then nothing would happen. If it's not properly repaired and you end up producing an SV, then you would see that um, you would have two copies of this side and versus one copy of that side. So you have a dosage imbalance. So if you look at the deletions and other things, um, for example, in this case, the, this gray bar of the reference genome got deleted. So if you focus on this junction, you would realize there's a dosage imbalance. The left side of the deletion, the DNA is retained and the right side of the junction, the DNA is gone. So there's a dosage imbalance. Then we can also use replication timing data from acid from cell lines to measure the, the timing of replication. So this is really measuring the timing. So uh, this is the location of a chromosome and the high value means early replication, low value means late replication. So the peaks represent the replication origin and the valleys represent the, the termination uh, site of the replication. So then you could define these sharp transition regions. So this region, is uh, the, the polymerase will most likely travel from this side to this side. So that's left replicated region. Then on this side, it's the right replicated region. You could define the orientation of replication. So then you could put all of these together, lay, lay over uh, on top of each other, and you could look for this kind of replicated strand bias in the SV signatures. And then not only you have this replication strand bias and this process, if the SV is a truly result from this collision, you would expect this bias would depend on gene expression because this whole process depends on the crashes caused by the transcription. So then we, 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 we do just that with the statistics and the calculating the p-values and do the multiple test adjustment. And in the peacock uh, cohort, that we found the tandem duplication three and four, which represent the larger uh, side of the, the, the duplication, they are enriched. And the same in the Hardwick metastasis cohort, it's the same uh, TD3, TD4, they are enriched. They show this uh, bias. So then um, we break down these genes into based on the expression we look at unexpressed gene versus expressed gene. So we do not see any uh, bias in unexpressed gene, and we only see this bias in expressed genes. So that's the second part of the pattern you would expect. That's this bias depends on gene expression. So in this case, the, the cohort is a cross cancer. Uh, we merge all the cancer together. So in the replication timing data we use is we merge 14 different cell lines together. That could cause problem. Uh, so we use the uh, MCF7, which is a breast cancer cell line. We use the replication timing measured by just this cell line. And we look at the breast cancer cohort uh, from this bigger cohort. And we see the same thing that you don't have bias here. You do have bias here. And in another independent breast cancer cohort, you see the same thing. And we can also reproduce that in the liver cancer cohort with the HEF-G2, which is the liver cancer cell line, you, if you match the replication timing just from the type of tissue uh, 
with the tumor type, you see the same thing. We actually did a lots of lots of other cohorts. I don't want to bore you to show you all the figures. They all look the same. So then uh, we can we can ask which tumor type have more of these tendon duplication phenotype. Um, so you see on the primary tumor side, you see ovarian cancer, you see a stomach cancer, breast cancer. They tend to have more of the tendon duplications. And this is the Hartwig metastasis cancer uh, cohort. Again, you see the ovarian cancer, esophageal stomach, breast cancer. So it's pretty much the same tumor types in different cohorts. You, you, you see this. But what, what's interesting is here you have a prostate cancer that's um, on, on the left side. The, you, you see a pretty decent group of tumors have very high numbers of tendon duplication. But in, if you look at here, this is prostate cancer. It's actually on the right side of the spectrum. There's only one tumor above this uh, line, if you say that's ultra high uh, tendon duplication phenotype. This is because these are tandem duplications in prostate cancer and ovarian cancer, they are related to CDK12 mutations. And the CDK12 mutations are known to uh, be associated with the uh, uh, worst outcome of prostate cancer. They are enriched in metastasis cohort. So CDK12 is a cycling dependent uh, kinase. The known function is to phosphorylate uh, RNA polymerase. So that also consistent with, with what we see because we see that the CDK12 mutation associated with the large tantum duplication, the large tantum duplication associated with the transcription replication collision. And if, you, if this gene is, uh, is doing something to the polymerase, RNA polymerase, maybe that, that, that's pretty consistent with, with, with the whole story. So then uh, our collaborator, Jonathan Cho at the UCSF, of us with a, a validation that we use this 22RB1, which is the prostate cancer cell line. We knocked out CDK12 with CRISPR and we measured with this thing called R loops. I'll tell you more what is R loops. Um, so after you knock out CDK12, you have increased amount of R loops. With, R loops is a, a potential DNA damage uh, structure. So then to directly measure the transcription replication collision, we use the assay called the proximity ligation assay, which measures the distance between DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. So you see when you knock out CDK12, you have increased amount of collision. So in the, in the normal cells, you do have a baseline amount of collision, which is true that you, in, in normal cells, the collision do occur. And once you get rid of CDK12, you have more collision. So now this is our current working model that if you get rid of CDK12, you can not properly phosphorylate the RNA polymerase too. So the transcription will have problem. The R loop is a hybrid of DNA and RNA. So in the normal condition, the transcription should go through and the RNA should be released. But if you have trouble with transcription, the RNA cannot be properly released, and then that will form a stable structure of DNA-RNA hybrid. And, and then that will cause, probably it will is the cause of the, this crash because once this RNA stay on, on the DNA for too long, the DNA polymerase came and it cannot go through, then the polymerase, will, the DNA replication will crash. And then if this cannot be properly repaired because CDK12 is actually controlling a lot of the expression of DNA damage repair pathway genes. So it, on one hand, you, it, with the mutation, you increase the amount of collision. On the other hand, you decrease the, the amount of protein that uh, in the repair pathway. So once this uh, replication uh, collision cannot be properly repaired, uh, one way is to this uh, fragment will fall back to upstream and restart the replication, which causing the polymerase go through the same DNA template twice and causing a tandem duplication. So um, again, motivated by the BRCA example that um, can we, if this re really represent a repair deficiency, can we target this repair deficiency? 
So there are drug screening data out there, like a PRISM that done by a Broad, a Broad Institute. They have screened over a thousand compounds in 500 cancer cell lines. So we just use these existing drug uh, screening data and use large tandem duplication as a biomarker for the transcription replication collision de repair deficiency. Uh, we ask the question, can we find a drug that can specifically kill the cells bearing this uh, repair deficiency? And we, this is done by the same postdoc, yeah, yeah. Um, we found the two drugs, V1 inhibitor and a PARP inhibitor. And uh, our collaborator, Jonathan, was able to validate that if you, if using the, so these are the drug screening from these 500 cancer cell lines. And then we use the same 22 RV1 cell line that we knock out to CDK12 and we, we would see if you treat the cells with this V1 inhibitor that without CDK12, the cells would become more sensitive to the drugs. So, and we also uh, did a lot more experiment with the PARP inhibitor and we can also reproduce the PARP inhibitor inhibitor can also specifically kill the cells that with CDK12 mutation, which potentially have this TRC repair deficiency. So what's interesting about this project is uh, all of these experimental and the, and the data modeling efforts are going in parallel. Uh, and we didn't know each other until last year, John came to U Chicago for a faculty job interview. And he was presenting this work. I was like, wow, this is exactly what we see. How about we write a paper together? So we end up getting uh, a paper together. Um, and then, then one day I showed him, we did the in silico drug screening. We came up with these two drugs. He was like, how on earth you come up with these two drugs? We use our cell line, CRISPR cell line. We screened a thousand compounds. We got the same exact drugs. I was like, wow. So all, we're, now we are very happy that all these experimental uh, results and our data modeling results are so consistent. Then I want to shift gears to tell you that one story about how they actually change 3D genome structure to contribute to disease. So there are a number of different functional consequences. One is that the SVs will change DNA dosage, the deletion, duplication will cause loss of tumor suppressors, gain of oncogenes. These are well known, being very well studied for decades. And also they change the DNA context, the order of DNA. So they produce gene fusions. And uh, the, the, there are about 15% of the tumors are known to be driven by fusions. But beyond that, we, we spend uh, many years working on fusions, but after a while, I figured maybe there are no more fusions to be found. At least the frequent ones are all being found already. So, but there are lots of um, SVs. If you just call SVs on the whole genome being sequenced, most of them really don't produce fusions, but there are regulatory elements in the genome, if you move them around the genome to a different chromosome, for example, there will be consequences. So for example, a number of years ago, we found in this rare tumor type called chromophore renal cell carcinoma, about 12% of the tumors, we have SVs very close to thirds. So here in this part, each dot is a tumor, and then we are measuring the distance of SV to thirds and the expression. So every time you have, uh, rearrangement around the turret. It's always around, never inside turret. They get activated. So this, this is actually a known phenomenon called the enhancer hijacking. It's been known for decades that some oncogenes like MYC, BCL2 in lymphoma, they hijack enhancers from the IGH locus, and then you activate oncogenes. And there are about a dozen such genes known as this. So this is, again, the, the same tumor I showed you again and again, is a kidney cancer genome. Um, the turret is on the tip of chromosome five and it actually hijacked a uh, enhancer from chromosome 13. So now we know this is true mechanism that will go on, uh, but can we do a systematic screening to find all of the genes? So we developed an algorithm, which is done by a postdoc Ali in, in, in the lab called the hyena. So it, the algorithm is a pretty complicated. The key step is here. We use a normal score regression 
to model the relationship between gene expression and SV. So if an onco gene is truly activated by enhancer hijinking mechanism, you would expect to see um, somatic SVs around the gene and you would expect the gene expression go up. But for, to, to, to do that, we really have to use normal score because normal score is, a, is so we first rank the tumors based on gene expression. So that's a non-parametric because we want to get rid of the, the scale. And, uh, and the, the gene expression, there are lots of outliers in, in, in the cohort. And if you just use log scale uh, gene expression value, you, you have a lot of problem. So we use a rank based. So it, it, it's a pretty robust and not too sensitive to outliers. So then, we also want to model a number of covariants, for example, tumor purity. The purity of tumor can range from 10% to 90%. That will affect the gene expression. And the copy number also affect the gene expression. So we want to control all of these. So the rank itself is not enough to, to, to control for all of those. So we have to turn, we map rank to a normal distribution and we use the, the Z score of that normal distribution as our normal score now we could do a typical linear regression with SV status and everything you want to, want to model in, in, in as a covariant. So in the end, we can get a pretty robust uh, result. So first, we, we have to test how good the method is. And, and the problem is we don't have a ground truth that we could test the, uh, the sensitivity, specificity, and precision, et cetera. So what we did, we again come back to this peacock cohort. Uh, now we only have over a thousand tumors because we need RNA seq to measure gene expression. So then um, only half of the tumors have RNA seq. Then uh, we went through the literature that we found eight genes in these twenty-five tumors that are known to be enhancer hijacking targets. So we test our algorithm and a few other uh, algorithms to see how can we catch these cases, known cases. So we are able to catch five out of eight and the CSAM can catch three out of eight and the Pangea cannot detect any. So our algorithm hyena is a pretty good in sensitivity. What about the specificity? So we, again, we don't have ground truth. It's tricky. So what we did was, um, so in these two cohorts, uh, lymphoma and breast cancer, we detect 16 and, and 61 genes. And then if we, if we scramble the gene expression data, it's random, randomly assigned to different tumors. So if this is, everything is random, you are not supposed to detect anything. So everything you detect would be false positive. Then we run this multiple times again and again. So we, we do occasionally detect some of the, some hits which represent uh, uh, false positive, but overall it, it, it's not too bad compared to the, the ones that we detect from observed data. So we do this in, uh, in the co uh, PCOR cohort, we have identified a total of 90, 192 genes from different, um, so, so many different tumor types. Uh, breast cancer has the most number of candidates because for two reasons, one is the sample size is large, two is breast cancer, and is one of the most unstable genomes, if you remember the st spectrum I showed you earlier. Then pancreatic cancer is a, is a second uh, tumor type with most uh, the candidate genes. So then we focus on pancreatic cancer. We picked one gene called top one antisense, which is a link RNA, it's not a protein protein gene. So it's altered by SVs in 10% of the pancreatic cohort. And uh, this is one of the example genome. Um, so we, in this particular patient, you have a, a chromosome 17 to chromosome 19 translocations. And then potentially the, the chromosome 19 enhancer would interact with top one as one on chromosome 17. Then we did a, a in silico or high C experiment. So this is, so since we know the translocation, we can construct a sequence and we can use an algorithm called Akita to predict the 3D structure of the genome. Um, so we could see that if you have a translocation, you are forming a new tag, the topological associated domain. So we're, now we are in the middle of doing capture high C. 
to see um, in, in experimentally that the, the, the top one AS1 is actually interacting with the enhancers from a different location of the genome. So then we perform the functional validation because this come up as a candidate of oncology. The, this was done by a, a graduate student at in the lab. Uh, so we did uh, two cell lines in pancreatic cancer cell lines. We measure cell invasions. We measure a lot of things. And most of them don't work. And we come up, we come, this phenotype come down to cell invasion. So if we overexpress this link RNA that we could promote cell invasion in cell lines. And then we also did a mouse experiment that we show if you overexpress this gene, that the mouse will have more metastasis in, in, in the tumors. So I started my lab as a 100% dry lab. And during COVID, I started to build a wet lab and spend probably two years with the student together to learn all these experiments. And now we can do mouse experiments. I was very excited um, that you can, we can actually develop an algorithm and, and, and finish up with a mouse experiment. When we submit the, the manuscript, the re reviewer number three, always reviewer number three, he said, um, I'm, I don't understand the algorithm too much, but I have so much problem with your experiment. So in, at the beginning, I knew if, if we do one cell line, it's not enough. So we did two cell lines. I knew if we only do in vitro experiment, it's not enough. So we did in vivo mouse experiment. So the reviewer said, you only did two cell lines. It's not enough. I want to see more. And you only did a tail vein injection, which is not enough. I want to see orthotopic injection. I have to Google what exactly is orthotopic injection. So you only did overexpression, which is not enough. I want to see, um, I want to see CRISPR. I was, oh man, this is an algorithm manuscript. <laughs> we have to do so many more experiments. But anyway, we are doing all those, uh, which just take uh, uh, maybe a year. So as a summary, I've shown you that complex rearrangement can be very abundant in cancer and our algorithm starfish extract there are six different complex SV signatures. And we've seen that large tandem duplications are associated with the transcription replication collision. And this association is very likely to be a causal relationship. And we see the tumors with CDK12 mutation are more sensitive to V1 inhibitors and the PARP inhibitor. And we have this algorithm called the hyena to detect the candidate oncogene that activated by uh, distal enhancers, and we have validated that this gene is an uh, is, uh, oncogene in pancreatic cancer. So I believe I mentioned most of the people that did the work along the way, and uh, um, this is the lab in Michigan in Sleeping Bear Dunes. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, all right. Any Any questions? Okay, uh, I have two questions. Um, the first question is um, on the SPOP. So in, in, in prostate cancer, SPOP is... Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, in SPOP, um, SPOP in prostate cancer is one of the few genes which has a prognostic role in the primary setting, where SPOP mutant tumors in generally metastasize uh, less frequently and also are, uh, have better overall survival. Um, my question is, um, and you find this association of this um, specific signature with enriched in the SPOP mutants. In general, have you looked the other way around, whether any particular signatures in prostate cancer or across your pan cancer cohort are associated with outcomes? Could some of them serve as prognostic or predictive biomarkers? Yeah, we, we look at all the survival related to the signatures. And if you read all those chromophrypsis related papers, they all say chromophrypsis related to worse prognosis, worse survival. We did that, we realized it, it's, we can't really say that uh, chromophrypsis because you have this TP53 in the middle, and TP53 mutant tumors, 
they have a lot more chromothriptis than other tumors. If you mix everything together, the survival difference you see is because of TP53. So if we split the cohort uh, of TP53 mutant versus wild type, if you only look at the TP53 mutant tumors, mm -hmm. then you look at different uh, chromothriptis or you look at tumors with or without the chromothriptis, there's no difference. If you look at the TP53 wild type tumors, you look at the with or without uh, chromothriptis, there's no difference. And we put this in, 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 a, in, a, in a manuscript, the reviewer said, this is a negative result, it's stupid, don't put it in it, <laughs> so we have to remove it. I think it's valuable that um, mm -hmm. a, at least uh, it, it argues against what, 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 what's being accepted in the field that chromothriptis is, is associated with worse outcome. But if you control for just TP53 mutation status, there's no difference. And it, it makes sense because no specific signature has been attributed to P53 loss. That's right, right? that's Not, right. Yeah, so probably. I think SPOP behaves similar because it, it's related to multiple mechanism. I think it, it probably plays similar role as TP53, which is not to promote a particular signature, but is a gatekeeper that allows the cells to tolerate those deleterious events. Although I should say that uh, on um, all the existing knowledge on what SPOP does do not implicate it in DNA damage, right? That's because, right, that's yeah. right. And I think that, so when people talk about SPOP mutation, they all say this is a loss of function. I don't think that that's true because if you have lost, if you want to get rid of the function, you can have uh, nonsense mutation, you have splicing mutation, you can have deletion, you can have all kinds of ways. But in SPOP, it's always missense mutation in the, in the target binding. Yeah. I think it, it's gain of function. It, it definitely is. I agree with you. Um, the second question is on the synthetic lethality. Well, I shouldn't say synthetic lethality. So you sh you 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 show or John 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 Chow's results show that CDK knockout cell lines are sensitive to we uh, kinase inhibitors. Uh -huh. The problem is with the CDK12 knockouts. I know at least of four faculty who tried to make CDK12 knockouts in CRISPR screens. It's an essential gene, and in general, so far experimentation has failed because of the inability to generate CDK12 knockout lines, they undergo cell cycle arrest and in general die. So how can you show sensitivity to a drug, something that is essentially dead, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, actually the, we are not targeting CDK12. It, it's no, the, no, the weak kinase, right? But, yeah. But it's in CDK12 knockout cell lines. Right, yeah, yeah. But so so the, cell, the cell lines are processed cancer cell lines. They are not normal. No. Right, so um, in cancer cell lines, I think uh, they are not that strictly depending on CDK12 anymore. I, I think, well, I think they do. I mean, I, I've seen so much effort, millions of dollars really spent into making CDK12 knockout lines. Yeah, they, they, this is a question we get from the reviewers that they want us to do a CDK12 knockout in normal cells. We just cannot do it. It's lethal to the, to the normal cells. And I, I, I personally, I val verified through sequencing many of such CDK12 knockouts. They always manage to repair the CDK12 through a variety of uh, a variety of means. So huh. even if the actual knockout, if it's a CRISPR knockout gets repaired, it, <laughs> the, the cancer finds its way to restore the re open reading frame of the- Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I see. So our collaborator has done uh, axon sequencing. So we, for the CRISPR knockout, um, I think he picked a single cell to generate a clone. So it's a pure cell population. Then did the CRISPR screen that we are able to see by allelic knockout that both allele have indels too. And we, we have this um, Western blot that we show um, here, um, no, here. Huh? Yeah, right, so CDK12, you really don't have any, yeah. Any more questions? <clears throat> so I um, have a vague memory about uh, 
the the using high C to detect rearrangements and then yeah. go one more step to discover the enhancer hijacking. I probably just uh, remembering what your phone has done. So could you comment on more and also what Jesse Jackson? Has yeah, done? yeah, yeah. I think a high C approach is quite complementary to uh, like Illumina whole genome sequencing that you you can truly detect um, rearrangement. But for enhancer hijacking, it's still challenging because you can see uh, you you can see the the new TAD domain forming. But for in regular high C, it's hard to see the enhancer promoter interaction unless you do capture high C or 4C that you specifically look for promoter region. That otherwise, you see a large domain like. Um, In high C experiment, you would get something like this. You see the domain boundary, you see a TAD structure, but it's very hard to see that this particular promoter is interacting with uh, which enhancer. Right. So, so for you, you use Hyena to establish that hypothesis. Yeah. Then you use CRISPR to validate that. We, we, so we use, um, just the uh, overexpression, and then we we were asked to do do CRISPR to knock out this gene to see whether um, right. you have the opposite oncogenic effect that slow down the metastasis. Right. I think for your phone and, and Jesse Dixon, they would do, do CRISPR to knock out the hijacked right, right. enhancer, right? The, yeah, the enhancer so brought you, in, then knock that down. Yeah, you yeah. could pinpoint which enhancer is responsible for right. the activation. But without doing that, the, the target region is still too broad, I think. Right, right. right. Got it. Okay, well, thank you. And I have one question. So uh, for the first project, uh, I feel like the uh, for most of the uh, signature that you, like, you clustered, are uh, highly relied on the uh, breakpoints that you caught from the WGS data. Yeah. And I was just wondering, like, like how, like, <clears throat> did you, like, do some, like, maybe some validation or maybe use long reads or even, like, the linked reads to validate those, like, structure or, like, the, uh, of the complex rearrangement or, like, the breakpoints? Yeah, yeah. In, 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 in uh, our glass chrome fibrosis, we did use, uh, um, Link the reads to we you can truly reconstruct a very complex structure of, of a, a, a bizarre chromosome. But the, the long read sequencing is not generally available for 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 cancer. There are only a very limited data set out there. So we happen we happen to have our glass enriched in prostate cancer, and we happen to have a link the read. Uh, sequencing available published uh, operative cancer so, so we found like two of sorry there, there is a link to data set from uh, from yeah i think that's what we used yeah Uh, for the transcription replication collision, yeah. um, you said that the random duplications are large. So how large they are? They are over 100 KB, but less than five megabase in and that so range. I'm just wondering like how the collision can happen if they're so far. Um, yeah, so a lot of the steps are, we are still unclear that how so what what exactly is caused the the collision to happen? Is it uh, really the R loop that's sitting there that block the way of DNA replication? Right, but like, yeah, we we are not entirely clear. If it's a collision, and, then it means that something has to be pretty close. So yeah, yeah. So at least is. by the proximity ligation assay, we are measuring the the collision between DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. I think that's the only assay out there that you could measure. Collision. Otherwise, I, I'm not aware that there are other better way to measure the collision. Hi, 
Great talk. Thank you. Um, for the, um, se what sequencing method did you use to sequence the structural variations? I think all of these are Illumina sequencing. Illumina? All short reads. Yeah. All short reads. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I have a question about the, so basically like I, my research is focusing on the uh, tumor, uh, the like the tumor that has like virus uh, associated with. And I also see that um, in the very beginning, the two plots that you show how, um, how those like tumors, like how each types of complex uh, structure variation contributed to tumor. And I, I do see there are cervical cancer and head neck cancer. Mm -hmm. So these two, like I know that they have like HPV um, associated with. Yeah. So, and I also see that there's one type of complex structure variation is like the EC DNA. Uh -huh. So did you like do like to, to like group those like um, tumors into positive and negative group, the HP positive and negative group? And then look I at, don't look think we it. did. Yeah, because I feel like um, in my research, I, I do see that HPV could integrate it into a human genome and then it will be copied together with a piece of the human segments. Uh -huh. So that the whole the whole piece can, can be like duplicated like for a lot of times. Yeah. So it's possible that uh, part of the like EC DNA breakpoints is contributed because of the uh, virus integrated, not because of the in, internal structure variation. So I guess it's possible that if we group the that if we group it like by whether integrated by HPV, we might say, see like different distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and another thing is um, I'm curious whether the starfish can be used in other type of sequencing data or it, it can only be used uh, on the whole genome. It, uh, short it, it takes CNV and SV as an input. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what platform you use. Uh, so you the provide like a, a bad, bad PE file for SV, and you provide a bad file for CNV, then you can run. Oh, okay. So like the you're going to um, provide the information of breakpoints. Yeah, and also yeah. The breakpoint uh, location, location, the copy number profile. And you're going to like um, like output will be the link plot to show. Yeah, like yeah. The, it will generate those. Plots. Oh, that's so great because I can uh, add the virus genome as another chromosomes, and then probably it can help me to telling me like how the virus integrated. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, very nice discussion. Uh, thank you. Let's thank uh, Dr. Yang again and thank you. Very, very well done.